Good evening, folks. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Hi, folks who are just joining us. Thank you all for being here. We'll just give it a few seconds to let the rest of the folk come on in. And I think we're good to go. Brilliant. Well, good evening, folks, and a very warm welcome to our online Nature Trek Roadshow. Indeed, good morning or good afternoon if you're joining us from another time zone. It's lovely to have you all here. I'm Sarah Frost, Nature Trek's Marketing Manager, and I'll be your host for this evening. And tonight I'm joined by two of our tour leaders, Neil McMahon and Jonathan Willett, along with Alison Steele from The Office, who oversees many of our tours in Scotland. Now, this evening is an evening that I've particularly been looking forward to. I've been with Nature Trek for almost seven years, but when I was offered the job, I was living on an island in the Hebrides, working as a wildlife guide on a whale watching boat. And I had to move down to the deep south of England here in Hampshire. And it was a bit of a shock moving to Hampshire. I no longer had a family of otters living on my doorstep. I didn't see eagles every day. And on my first day in the office, I saw more people than I'd seen during a whole winter up in Scotland. And we only have about 30 staff, so it was a real shock. And Scotland holds a really special place in my heart. It's certainly one of my most favorite places in the world. And I've been really pleased to lead our Scottish cruises to St Kilda every year, along with a couple of our tours to Mull. And I think within the UK, Scotland offers some of the best opportunities for watching wildlife. Its landscapes encompass a huge array of habitats from mountains, forests and locks to seemingly just endless coastlines of white sand beaches, lowland moors, offshore islands, Macca, of course, and the heaths. And if you add to all of this the species that live in the habitats and a vibrant Gallic culture, along with some excellent whiskey, then wildlife holidays in Scotland have a unique charm. And to take us there on our virtual journey this evening, we have Neil and Jonathan, who are kindly going to guide us on a grand tour, starting with Neil, who's taking us to the westernmost part of Scotland's mainland, Ardnamurchan. So as always, folks, do put your questions to us using the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. We'll type answers to you throughout the evening if we can, and we'll also take time to answer them in more detail at the end of the night. So I hope you're sitting comfortably, pop your feet up, and for the next two hours, you can just relax and be taken on a journey across Scotland. Over to you, Neil. Thank you very much indeed. And after that wonderful introduction, I feel like I don't need to say anything. I think you've covered all bases, really, but um, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> <Sorry>. uh, <laughs> Okay, well, very good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's uh, Neil Matman. I've had the privilege of being working with Nature Trek for a good number of years now. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about um, the Yard the Merkham, uh, which is a place that's very much uh, close to my heart, having uh, led tours here since 2016. Um, this year, it was particularly popular, as you might imagine. Uh, we had over a dozen tours uh, working off the peninsula. And there are three main tours that uh, Nature Trek try to, to run each year. Uh, one is Wild Scotland in Spring. Uh, the second one is Scotland's Mammals and Highlights of the Highlands, which tends to be from August into September. And then towards the end of the season, September through to October, uh, we run a shorter tour for deer rut, looking at how the red deer uh, behave during the, the breeding season. Anyway, what I'm going to try and do is just give you a very short whistle-top tour about what the Yard of is all about. Um, it's steeped in history, archaeology, uh, there's loads of wildlife, of course, wonderful landscapes, um, and there's still a significant culture there that's been preserved. Um, and perhaps more than anything else, as sort of suggested in my title, it's the tranquility of the place that absolutely, absolutely captures it for me. There are probably no, no such thing as a wilderness left in the UK anymore. But I think when you get to this part of Scotland, it's about as close as you can get. So when we actually uh, start our tour anywhere to, to the Isle of Merkin, uh, Glasgow tends to be the, the point where we pick everybody up. And then we have the wonderful scenic journey that, that takes us um, up on the A82, uh, up past the west side of Loch Lomond, um, up over Rannoch Moor and through the wonderful Glencoe, and this is a picture of Glencoe here, 
Uh, we pop down to places like um, we're stopping at Tin Drum for, for refreshments. And I'm, a, I'm guilty of really sort of not passing anything by that I think is worth a good look. So when I take the tours, I'm afraid the journey takes quite a long while because I like comfort stops and an opportunity of seeing any wildlife along the way. So we'll look at we'll stop at quite a few different places. But eventually we'll get to Glen Borrowdale. And Glen Borrowdale um, is halfway along the, the Ardmore Peninsula and is, is, is the place where we, where we stay. Now this is Glen Borrowdale Castle. And no, we don't stay in the castle, but we're right next door to it in some rather um, very comfortable accommodation, which is unflatteringly called the bunkhouse, the Ardmore bunkhouse. It's far better than a bunkhouse, I have to say. And the setup there is that we have a lovely sort of um, uh, nine ensuite rooms. Um, there's a, a, there's a, a kitchen area, and it's actually built for, for self-catering. But of course, we utilize it by, by using it for our breakfast, our evening meals, if we're not eating out, and also for our, uh, it's very much our home for, for, for eight days. Um, so it is, a, it is an opportune um, place for us because it's halfway along the peninsula. It takes a long while to get there, but once we're there, everything's on our doorstep. Um, the most significant, perhaps, sort of feature really of our, our tour when we're on the Isle of Merkin is Loch Sunart, which is a picture, this is a picture of it, which is 19 miles long. It's a sea loch. Um, it can reach depths up to 120 meters. Um, it was carved out by the glaciers in relatively recent times. And although you might have a job to see it on this picture, down on the right hand side is a little tiny boat, which we use for some of our excursions on the loch. But the beauty of Scotland, I always think, is yeah, it's great on foot, uh, great moving around in a vehicle, but it's wonderful if you can actually um, use a boat to get to some of the places as well. And that's what we do. Um, this is a, an area of temperate rainforest. So we've got um, sessile oaklands, um, sometimes called sort of the Celtic um, rainforest. Uh, and this time of year in early spring, we still got, we've got the start of the greens, the mosses, the lichens, the drapes, uh, bryophytes on these wonderful oak trees, because it is so wet on this side of Scotland. Um, you have this wonderful, uh, wonderful forest, and there are some lovely remnants there, particularly around Ariundel Woods near Strontium, which we visit. And of course, in this part of the world, as, as already suggested, we are the most westerly part of the British mainland. So for those things, the land's end, is the very end of the UK mainland. Sorry, but it's actually the point of Ardmurka where this wonderful lighthouse sits. It's also a good spot for us to actually visit. There's a cafe there. Uh, you can do tours of the lighthouse. And of course, it's a great spot for actually looking for wildlife, particularly seabirds and any sea mammals that happen to be passing by in the waters. As you can see, I took this picture from, from a boat looking back, but often as not, I'm on the land looking back the other way. And we'll always have a an opportunity of looking at all the islands around us as well. Um, islands such as coal and muck, egg, rum and sky are often very visible from this one point. So you get a lovely panoramic view of the, of the whole area and of the Hebridean Sea and that, that inner Hebridean circle. And of course, being a, being a, a, a Yard of Merkin actually feels like an island. When you're on it, it does feel like an island. So I keep almost saying island. And of course, we have a good, um, good head of red deer and all over Scotland, whether you like it or like it or not, the red deer are managed, but you don't see many stags such as 16 pointers such as this. And you do see some very large bulky beasts when you're actually on the Isle of America. And we make a point of actually trying to find um, the best of the stags either during the day or the night. But in the spring, I'm going to talk about the, the Wild Scotland spring trips initially. Of course, spring is all about new birth, new life. And the deer share the, the moors and the uplands with, um, with the sheep. So we have a lot of hill farming up here very small breeds of sheep, fairly hardy things, but nevertheless, nevertheless it's, it's a tough world for them. So we encounter these, these lambs pretty much wherever we go along the roads and in the fields. And it wasn't until this year that I'd ever actually been in a position to witness uh, a brood of long-tailed tits just after they'd come out of their wonderful uh, little round ball nest. And uh, this actually happened on one of our tours this spring, uh, where there we have something like, I think it's either nine or 10, baby long-tailed tits that have just come out of their nest and all sitting on a little branch, a bit obscured, I'm afraid. And of course, we got nice and close to those and it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. So spring's all about this new opportunity to see new life. Now, we devote a whole day on this tour um, to actually going out onto a boat onto the Hebridean Sea. We go south from, um, from the Isle America and we visit the wonderful um, island of, <coughs> excuse me, we, we, we visit the uh, wonderful island of Staffa, 
And here you can see Fingal's cave, and you might have picked a few people on the right hand side. This is, where, this is the place with the wonderful basalt columns, uh, very similar to the similar sort of geology in Ireland. And when we're on the on Stafford, we have an opportunity of being on the island for about an hour or so. And we have an opportunity of walking along the little tiny causeway to the cave, but also spending some time on top of the island as well, looking at a few bits of wildlife. Um, it's another wonderful, wonderful place, which if we can, we'll try and choose the best day of the week's weather to actually get out there to really appreciate the beauty of this place. Rock pigeons, as a typical bird, will be foraging on the, along the edges, on the seaweed, on the rocky areas. Tough little passerine that um, you really can't dismiss and you see it all, all over the place. I have to say this bird is a, it's a tour leader's um, joy, really, in as much that you don't have to work too hard to please guests when you've actually got puffins on your itinerary. So a lovely thrifting flower, and there we have a, a couple of puffins sitting out there, and I'm wondering what's, what, what life holds for them. Um, you can just add a focus of the basalt columns behind, so that's on Staffa. Once we leave Staffa that same day, we just go 15, 20 minutes across the way down to the Treshnish Islands, which are easily within view. And on the Treshnish Islands, we take a landing on the Isle of Longa, where there is a significant seabird colony. And again, we have a good head of puffins here, which really do allow you to get this close. They're so used to people there now, but in actual fact, you really don't have a problem getting fantastic views. You don't need expensive camera gear to really appreciate these wonderful birds. And alongside the puffins, of course, we have the razor bills, we have the lamarts, the pretty weights, and all those other typical seabirds. And we have something like ooh, a couple of hours on there, and it goes past so quickly, just too quickly. And if you get an opportunity, you might get lucky to see the marauding great skewer, which doesn't normally nest on these aisles, but often does summer there. And sometimes they just sit themselves down and they've decided they're not going to move for anybody and allow you a nice close approach. So this is a, this is a, a bit of a, a wolf of the sea, if you like. So it's, a, it's an apex predator that tends to um, cause problems in the other seabirds, young, young and old together. Um, whilst we're out on the sea, of course, there's always an opportunity of seeing something um, other than a bird. And we always look very hard for sea mammals. I'm afraid we don't always have such a wonderful view of a bottlenose dolphin as this, but there is always an opportunity of seeing bottlenose dolphin, common dolphin, maybe harbour poor person. If you're really lucky, maybe a minky whale as well. So the beauty of being on a boat, uh, being on the sea, of course, you never really know what you're going to see. Going back to the bunkhouse, um, there's, there are bird feeders there all, all year round. So as a consequence, even if we have a bit of a wet day uh, or some time around the bunkhouse, uh, we can see plenty of wildlife, including this beautiful male siskin. And because the insect life really isn't um, affected by pesticides and insecticides in this part of the world, uh, we still have a, a nice, healthy population of swallows. And we get plenty of use of swallows and house martins as well. And of course, for many people, they've gone all this way up to the Isle of Merca because they've heard of this chap or chapess, and that's the pie martin. And we're very fortunate at the bunkhouse that so Nature Trek have a very special. Uh, mixture of food, I'm afraid it is a secret, um, which we entice these pine martins out for. So I'm afraid we cheat a little bit and put this food out and they come out most evenings uh, and provide a really nice display for us. So a little bit of cheating, but what a wonderful way to see a fantastic animal that's actually doing very well at the moment. It's not just animals and birds. Whilst we're up on the Isle of Merkin in the spring, um, the very first of the insects are beginning to emerge is gold ringed dragonfly, but on this occasion was munching a bumblebee, I believe. And as the, as, the, as the season progresses, and we're thinking about more about sort of the Scottish mammals and highlands tours in August and September, then the plethora of insects begins to gather pace. And so you've got the uh, devil's bit scabious, which becomes uh, fairly significant in this part of the world and begins to flower. Uh, and out comes the uh, large pine hoverflies and all the other nectaring insects. And of course, in the insects, we try very hard to ensure that um, we try to see as many butterflies as we can, such as this small copper. And of course, a lot of people want to see the Scotch Argus, which has a fairly significant distribution around Scotland and Northern England. Very dark, slow flying uh, butterfly, but uh, nevertheless, it's, it's a great thing to see. But for most people, the one they want to see, but it's only a very small window of opportunity, is the checkered skipper, which is only known from about 30 well-known sites. Uh, including some of the places we go to, which again includes Ariondal Woods. But also, they have been seen at Glen Borrowdale as well. So this is a very scarce butterfly that uh, recently went extinct in, in England, um, although there are some reintroductions uh, going on at the moment. And the grayling, which is a coastal butterfly, we'll look for that around a place called Sanna, which is a beautiful 
uh, beachy area on the northwest side of the Isle of Murphy. So we'll endeavour to try and see um, some grayling as well. And the last perhaps of the butterflies I've got a picture of is the dark green fritillary. And when we get there in August or early September, it's pretty much at the end of the flight season. Uh, but normally we manage to find one or two of these butterflies as well. Um, something which doesn't, which is there all year round, we don't really have any problems seeing these. It's called the Highland Coo or the Highland Cow, Highland Cattle. And there's actually a small herd of these actually close to where we stay, which um, are nice and friendly. So if you want some iconic photographs, it isn't a problem getting sort of creamy colored ones, black colored ones, ginger ones, rust colored ones. But of course, the other animal we all want to see when we come to Scotland is of course the otter. And we put an awful lot of effort into ensuring that everybody on our tours gets at least a glimpse of otters. And just occasionally you get wonderful views like this as well. It's all about being persistent and patient and all the tour guides that operate these tours know the best places to find otters. But sometimes you just have to keep going back to that same place again and again and again until eventually you get one. And if you're very fortunate and you get some, some nice close-ups like this, then, then so much the better. I know the otters are doing very well all over the UK now, but for me, I still love to see them in this sort of, um, this beachside, rocky, um, seaweed area of Scotland. They do look very special in this habitat. And in the autumn, because there is more offspring around, perhaps it's better and easier for the mammals than it is in the spring. And we can get some nice close-up views of pine martins. Sometimes they even come out um, toward in daylight conditions, and sometimes they're literally on the windowsill of where we're staying. So it's always a, a huge plus. Um, the terrain up in the Isle of Merkin is very varied. On the north coast, this is Swardle Bay. Um, it's flat with lots of uh, volcanic rock. Um, this was an area where the Vikings first made, uh, first made their landings many, many moons ago. And it's also a place where a Viking boat was found in Tack Ferry just off this beach just there. So there's a lot of history and archaeology with it as well. For photographers, there's an opportunity of getting into the deer, of course. Uh, the red deer uh, do become a little bit habituated. This one was on the, uh, the grass lawn of where we were staying and really didn't know fear at all. So, but also we have other deer species and we'll try and get onto roe deer and fallow deer where we can, the red deer dominates. And this is a Pierre David's deer, which there's a small number of them here in the Highlands. We make every effort to try and see this globally threatened species. And of course in the autumn, uh, we have the fungi. So uh, where it gets wet, uh, lots and lots of fungi out there. And if you're an expert on fungi, come along and teach me because I absolutely know nothing about it whatsoever. So just sort of wrapping up this little bit on the Arda Merkin. If you're into your landscapes, you love your rock formations, you love the sea, you love the sky, the colours, the contours, then the Isle of Merkin is a place you'll absolutely love. Um, it isn't necessarily walking country, it's one of these places where you just simply sit there and just in awe of the landscape. And instead of the, the Treshnish Islands and Staffa, our boat trips in the autumn trips, we go out to the Isle of Muck where we can and we tour around the Hebridean Sea, where we bump into things like common seals. And the waders are more numerous, so we start to see things like curlews and red shanks in the coastal areas, maybe turnsels and sanderlings. And we see these post breeding flocks of goosanders and sometimes red breasted magansas and locks soon out as well. So, a different kind of aspect of the wildlife. Not far away, there's a very large colony of breeding Manx shearwaters on the Isle of Rum. And the point of Arda Merkin, where the lighthouse is, is a favoured area for them to, to rest on the water and, and large rafts. And sometimes we're fortunate to get quite close to them to one of the boats that goes out to muck. And also other seabirds as well, such as this non-breeding common guillemot. Just occasionally, just occasionally, we get lucky and we come across a pod of common dolphins. And people don't realise that the British Isles, particularly the west side, uh, provides an opportunity, probably the best opportunities in the world to see some fantastic numbers of common dolphins still and bottom of dolphins. So just occasionally we get very, very lucky. So just coming to the end of this presentation, uh, just a couple of few bits for you to have a look at. This is Ben Hiant in the top end of the, uh, the picture, uh, which is the, the highest area of the Isle of Merkin. Uh, the, bit, the beach down below is Camna Gial, and this sort of signifies how, how the, the Isle of Merkin might look today. But many hundreds of years ago, there was large numbers of people living in this kind of habitat. And the, the terrain on this beach area uh, was obviously being tilled and agricultured for many years and there's also now the place where we stand to look for this. So the Ardemurkin does have a healthy eagle population. Uh, the golden eagles are perhaps not doing so well and we do struggle sometimes to see a really nice view of the golden eagle but it's close relative the white-tailed eagle, uh, iconic species now 
Um, it's a wonderful bird that uh, we don't ever fail to see now, and often we see them very well, uh, both juveniles and adults, because there's now plenty of pairs uh, which are actually nesting on the peninsula. So just a last picture, uh, really just signifies the fact that, yes, I'm in love with the Arbonneur, and yes, I love the different contours and different textures, and you can see in a picture like this, the different habitats. Uh, also, there's a rainbow there, so not getting away from the fact this is West Scotland. You do get some rain, you do get some showers. It's always very mild. You do get some lovely sunshine as well. And more recently, whether it's due to the climate tonight, I don't know, we've seen some very warm and sunny periods whilst we've been there. But whatever the weather throws at us, it's a very special place. And I very much hope that I've inspired you to come and join us either next year or very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Neil. That was fantastic. Uh, real uh, trip down memory lane for me to see all of those images there, although uh, not too long a memory ago. I was only there in, uh, in June, <laughs> but you know, it's uh, oh, Loch Suna it has to be one of my favourite places. Uh, right, over to Jonathan now. Folks, just uh, quickly before I hand over to Jonathan, a couple of people are saying that they're just having sound issues. Um, I'm not sure if this is just affected on uh, individual individual devices because I could hear Neil very clearly um, but a few people have said that the sound went up and down um, hopefully we'll be able to resolve that for you I'm not sure if you're able just to try leaving the webinar and then coming back again um, maybe that you know the the old turn it off and on again trick uh, might do it um, oh, someone's saying they can hear fine thank you that's good to hear so it's it's not uh, yeah, sound is perfect. Brilliant. OK, so I do think it is it is um, the devices. Right. Well, in that case, I'll hand over to to Jonathan, um, who has a microphone. So hopefully no problems with sound there. And Jonathan, you are taking us over to Allerdale. So over to you. And thanks very much, Neil. OK, thanks very much for uh, the introduction. And uh, thanks very much for having me uh, to come and present. I'll just go and get my screen shared. There we go. Uh, so the, the trip that uh, I went on, well, I led uh, just a few weeks ago uh, was at Allerdale. And I do realise that I really should have taken a photograph of a map to tell you where it is, but I shall describe it. Um, so Allerdale is a, a reserve. It is not a Highland estate. Uh, the gentleman that owns it, Paul Lister, is very, very firm about that. And he's got very firm ideas with what he's trying to do uh, with the reserve. And he's owned it since 2003. So he's had 18 years um, sort of helping transform it with uh, the help of his very, very able staff. So Allerdale is north of Inverness. So if you've been up to Inverness, you go on the A9 heading north. Uh, you go past uh, the Black Isle, you go past Invergordon, you go up towards Tain. Um, and at Tain, you'll turn left and you take the road along the south shore of the Dornoch Firth. And that will take you to a place called Ardguy. And then from Ardguy, you take a turn off through the village and you head another seven miles inland. And then from there, you head another three miles uh, along a very well-made track, which will take you to the Allerdale Estate. So when you get there, you do feel as if you're very much uh, in the middle of nowhere and uh, you're kind of close to it. Uh, so this is the um, Reserve Lodge itself, uh, which was built in the late 1800s for the Earl of Ross, who owned an awful lot um, of this particular part of Scotland. It's called Easter Ross. Uh, you can see there's a, a new extension out of the back, uh, that low building. Uh, that's where there's a gym, uh, there's a dining room, and there's uh, even a sauna as well, uh, should you desire. Uh, the main building is where the guests stay. So it's uh, it's a bit of a change, I guess, from uh, the hostel that Neil was talking about. Uh, this is this is a little bit more um, higher class, I guess you would say. Uh, but you can see where the uh, where the lodge itself settles. It's on a, it's a beautiful hillside. You've got a fantastic view over to the hills on the other side with some dead pine trees. And uh, off a morning, uh, you can sit out the front and you can go and see what's flying by. And uh, we've had all sorts of things flying by when we went there. Um, the trip itself was running in the middle of October, as it was. Uh, this is a close-up view of the um, the lodge itself. So the 
the main uh, bedrooms are in the upper floors, as you can imagine. There's a beautiful um, dining room, which is the bay window to the right hand side of the entrance, uh, which is a most fantastic view and a very lovely fire, wood, uh, wood fire there to keep us all nice and warm. Um, on the far left, on the lower ground floor, there's a boot room and a drying room. So even if you do get wet, um, all your stuff gets dried out for the morning. And it really is very, very comfortable. And uh, you do have uh, some staff to go and look after you, which is, uh, which is very pleasant. And we do have a personal chef. Um, so don't come on this particular trip if you're, you're, you're on a diet, I would say. Um, there are no calories in a holiday. I'm sure you've heard that before. Now, we didn't see one of these quite so close, um, but on the other side of the, of the, the valley of the Glen from the, the, the main uh, the lodge, we did actually get to see one of these flying by, and one of the guests did get a record shot from a distance. And uh, there's been juvenile sea eagles that have been flying up the glen and overwintering, um, feeding mainly on deer carcasses or the garalachs, the, the guts of the deer that are left behind on the hill uh, after they're shot. And certainly um, Paul Lister, the, the owner, is very, very hopeful that one day they will actually nest. And he's even built a nest platform within sight of the lodge, uh, which you can go and have a look at. But they haven't used that yet. Um, but there is a pair of um, white-tailed eagles that are nesting over on the East Coast now in the Highlands. Um, so we're high hopes that they're, they're going to start expanding. And obviously, that's a pretty exciting bird to go and see. Uh, this is a slightly fuzzy shot of uh, the dining room, uh, so it's all very civilised. We have a full dining table. Uh, this was actually at breakfast, um, so the breakfast is usually pretty good. Well, it's always pretty good. Uh, you've got porridge, uh, you've got granola, you've got fruit, and then you've got uh, cooked breakfast, and uh, the sausages went down particularly well, uh, it has to be said. Um, also from the window, uh, which is behind the gentleman on the far right in the orange roll neck sweater, uh, you can actually see a deer sometimes walking by. Uh, there's a particularly cheeky Sika deer stand. Uh, that was there when we were there. Um, but the standard of food really is out the top drawer um, and um, there's quite a lot of cake that goes with it as well. Of course, the cake is optional, um, but um, we certainly didn't have a morning or an afternoon that went by um, unless we had, uh, without some cake. And uh, everybody, you know, very, very manfully sort of stood up to the challenge and managed to eat just about all of the cake that was put in front of them. This is the view from the, the front lawn. Um, so we're looking over to the rolling hills of Glen Calvey over on the far side. Um, over to the far right on the skyline, you might be able to just make out uh, one of the dead pine trees uh, that's on the top. Now we did have, we couldn't say for certain, but I was pretty certain that they were juvenile ring uh, that we had in the trees on uh, a couple of the days we're looking at through the telescope. Um, we did have some red wing that came in a little bit later on, but uh, but more of the ring usel a bit later on. So it's just utterly spectacular. You're in, you're pretty much in the middle of nowhere. You have amazing, amazing night skies. We've got to see Saturn and Jupiter at night through the telescope, and the moon was just amazing. Uh, so no light pollution. Very, very quiet indeed. Um, there's no road going through. You don't really hear any noises at all. And uh, you just have this most spectacular vista when you walk out of the door. It really is something very, very special. Um, now, Neil did make mention of uh, Hairy Heelan Coos. And uh, yes, of course, the natives are there. So there was plenty of uh, Hairy Highlanders to go and encounter. Uh, this was at a lodge called Gianich, uh, which is almost as far as you can go in the estate. Uh, you can actually go another sort of three miles further along a road and um, just behind the cattle um, up towards the hill right at the back, which, yes, you might be able to just make out does have snow on it. And uh, we did get snow uh, on a couple of um, evenings and overnight, only on the very, very highest tops. Um, but uh, yeah, one of the hills, which is 2,700 feet high, was, uh, was fairly snowy. Um, so yeah, the, the cattle went down pretty well and they were most disappointed that they weren't getting fed. But there you go. Um, you can't see to the right of this little plantation on the right. There is an old building um, which does have a barn owl box in it and the barn owls do nest there. And that's one of the things that we look out for when we go on our night drives. We also get some really spectacular um, colours, uh, particularly in autumn. The, the, the tour next year is going to run sort of from spring, summer uh, into autumn. So it will be a slightly different itinerary from the autumn one. But we spent an awful lot of time um, on, on, the, on the reserve itself. We were only off away for one day. I uh, we went away to Loch Fleet to go and look at some uh, waders and sea duck and seals. Um, 
but the the colors are just absolutely spectacular uh, in the autumn time uh, really really amazing and beautiful beautiful light um, and some really lovely old trees both living uh, and in the back you can see there's a, a dead scots pine tree which is known as a bone by lichenologists and uh, these can stay standing for up to 300 years uh, in this dead state and they just are very very photogenic now, deer um, are obviously red deer in particular are one of the key things that we're um, going to go and have a look at, and we can get quite close uh, to the red deer. Um, this is Ronnie, who's one of the stags. Um, he'd done his rut. Um, we had we did see rutting deer, but Ronnie had done his rutting, and he came back to the house to go and uh, feed round about the house. Uh, the, the the big stags like the grass and basically just go and hang out there and recover over the winter time. Um, so Innes, who's the, the head ranger there, who's been there for uh, over 20 years, uh, he was saying, you know, usually it's about sort of the, the 9th or the 10th of October that the stags come back and uh, just a day late, uh, Ronnie made an appearance. And as you can see, a really, really impressive stag. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So he's a 14 pointer, um, but he's a big old boy. Uh, got a really beautiful red coat and coming into his winter coat as well. And uh, we did really get some fantastic close views. So that's probably about um, my 400 millimeter lens zoomed into about 300. So I had to kind of zoom out a little bit because I was getting a bit too close. Um, so I was only about 20 foot away uh, from Ronnie. Uh, the deer, when they're, when they're rutting, were a wee bit further away, but we do get good views off them and we certainly do hear them really well. Um, just a different view uh, of the, the antlers and uh, really, really impressive. Um, some quite big deer that we saw uh, certainly out in the rut, but the, the most dominant stags are the ones that finish first. Um, so they were knackered basically and just were looking to kind of recoup their energy uh, after all of their efforts of the previous four weeks. And there's a nice close view uh, of Ronnie. Um, obviously, we wouldn't want to get too close to him when he was full of testosterone, but thankfully the testosterone levels are just um, disappearing almost completely and uh, they become very, very docile. But their testosterone levels go up about, I think it's about a thousand times. Um, so from pr practically nothing to an awful lot during the rut. And uh, yet yeah, they are very, very aggressive and you can hear them roaring, uh, which is really quite something if you've never heard the roaring before. Um, so it sounds a bit like a really hoarse bellow uh, from a cow. Uh, just roaring away, um, sometimes all night and through the day as well. And uh, just down on the left hand side, the, the, the right hand side, this is this octagonal hut. Uh, this is um, Innes's office. He's the, the head ranger. Uh, there's three members of staff there. Um, Ryan and Neil are the others. And uh, this is a cheeky little Sika stag uh, that would wander around sometimes at, at dinner, sometimes at breakfast, and um, yeah, perhaps taunting Neil. There are some Sika deer in the area. They are a non native species, but they're almost impossible to control. And uh, Innes just keeps the levels down at a low level, so they're not, uh, not taking over. Uh, at all, but there's very large numbers of deer in the glen just to the north, so there's 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 really no hope of eradicating. So it's best to just have some holding a territory and hopefully keeping the others at bay. Um, this was a particularly dark individual. You could see it was very different um, when you were close up to it. Different coloured antlers, different shape, different size, and um, different coloration. And we did get some really good views, particularly early in the morning, uh, from this particular individual. Now, one of the things that Alladale's got is they've got a breeding program for wildcat. And uh, this particular individual was a large male and they've had a very successful breeding program this year. Um, they had two kittens from one pair and they had four from another. Uh, so they did really, no, sorry, it was just four they had. The previous year was two. Um, they had four kittens, which is exceptional. It really is. It shows they're obviously very happy cats. Um, we were taken down by Ryan, who looks after the cats, to see the enclosure, and um, they are just endlessly photogenic. They are just absolutely amazing. Um, so we did see the kittens, but we also saw this big male sort of scowling away. He wasn't actually hissing at me. This was just a precursor to a yawn without giving too much away. Um, but it does show, <laughs> does show the whiskers and it does show the teeth. Uh, and uh, many of the Highland clans had the the cat as their symbol, the wild cat as their symbol, um, touch not the cat but with a glove. And if you see those canines, um, you certainly understand why. Uh, famously untamable. Um, no one's ever managed to tame a wild cat kitten. So the kittens that are being bred here will 
hopefully in the next year or two actually be released into the wild because there's going to be a, a release program going on and the breeding that's been going on in captivity of the wild cats is to produce uh, a, a number of cats that can be released back into the wild so uh, if you um, just have a google of the the wild cat project uh, which is a multi-partner project you can find out more about it but it was really really fantastic to get close to the cats and there you go now, the places that we go to, there's three main glens. This is Glen Allerdale, there's Glen Moore, the big glen, and there's Glen Beck, which is the small glen. Um, so we went to all of them on at least one occasion on Glen Moore because it was the most accessible one. We went there twice. Um, on this particular day, uh, it wasn't the best of days. Uh, the storms were coming in a little bit. It was windy, but we did get to see six ravens. Uh, which was really good. And then on the way back, we did get to see a hen harrier. There'd been a male hen harrier uh, hanging about uh, round about in the, in the valley floor. And uh, we got a really good view of one going flying along the burn and then going away into quite a heavy rain shower. Uh, but we all got a look and it was absolutely amazing that just the male just showed up so well. Um, and they're really hopeful that this is a sign of things to come with uh, uh, the reduction in deer numbers and the tree planting. Uh, it's meaning that there's more cover for birds and also more voles that are um, being found in the ground and hopefully enticing birds such as this um, to come and go and stay on a more permanent basis. Uh, so this is all part of the, the wilding that's going on. Now, oops, wrong way, sorry. Now, ptarmigan, now these were a little bit difficult to get. Um, the weather wasn't particularly kind. Uh, there was a big snowstorm, um, but three individuals were... Um, keen enough and also fit enough to go and do the walk and um, you're taking some of the way in an Argo cat and then the rest of it was walking up the top of the hill and uh, they got some fantastic sightings of I think it was 11 ptarmigan um, not too far away from them and it was um, yeah really quite something to go and see uh, the, but the ptarmigan is a bit of a walk to get there and is also a bit of a rough ride in the Argo so uh, there's no there's no guarantees but uh, but certainly we're very fortunate to go and see uh, the ptarmigan and their their feathered feet so they actually have feathers on the underside of their feet unbelievably very well adapted uh, for living in snowing conditions um, just more of these wonderful, wonderful um, autumn colours and also incredibly strong sunlight and a very, very grey and foreboding cloud behind. <laughs> uh, but thankfully, this one didn't come to anything. We were just there at the right time for the red wings to start to appear. We only got red wings about the fourth day in. Um, they were quite flighty initially, but then we got really some really, really nice views. This is a red wing eating haws off of Hawthorn. Um, we got them mainly on the rowan trees and uh, there was a flock of um, up to about 40 that were flitting about quite regularly um, and a handful of uh, field fare with them. So we got some really, really nice views off them and uh, just that lovely sort of seep, seep, very, very quiet, uh, high pitched call that they have. Um, but it was just great to see them flying round about really quite close to the house as well. Now, of course, it wasn't just um, about birds and it wasn't just about landscape or it wasn't just red deer. We did find a moor club, believe it or not. So this is um, one of the fairy club fungi. Um, so an eagle eyed member of the uh, of the, the guests uh, didn't stand on this one and pointed it out. And uh, yeah, yeah. So it's only actually about two and a half, three centimetres tall. So it's really quite tiny. Um, but just that it's in, the fungi that we found uh, were absolutely amazing. Uh, we also found this one. This is a member of the tooth fungi, which is really quite a small group uh, of fungi. It's called the scaly hedgehog fungus. And um, according to the National Biodiversity Network, uh, it hadn't been recorded previously um, on Allerdale. Uh, so we need to go and check up with the species list there to go and find out if this was a new one. But they do have uh, a pocket of old pine wood, not a huge amount of old pine wood, but they do have some and also quite uh, extensive areas of birch wood, certainly the lower levels. And um, yeah, just the the species that were found there were just really, really fantastic. And of course, lots of lichen as well. We've got lots of tree lungwort here, this green um, sort of lobed lichen. Uh, looks a bit like the inside of our lung if it's unwell. And in the old days, it was used to make um, cures for diseased lungs, believe it or not. Um, but this is quite a rarity in continental Europe, but very, very common from the central uh, to the western part of the highlands. Uh, this is looking down uh, Glenmore, uh, Genich, where we saw the Highland cattle, or just is the, the little um, lodge there is just to the right hand side of where the trees are. You can see the, uh, the winding river going down. And this was on our last day, actually, uh, just as the sun was going down and just incredibly beautiful. 
And this was the barn owl. Um, we did see it at night time. We did night drives um, pretty much every night. And we got given a night scope as well, which was worth several thousand pounds. So Innes trusted me with that. And we could actually go out and it was it's not night vision, it's heat, uh, heat sensor. And so it's a monocular you look through. And um, we, we picked up on the best night, we picked, and, picked up 104 red deer in groups um, all round about the vehicle. So we drive up Glenmore about 45 minutes, stop, listen, and hear the the deer roaring away, uh, which is just absolutely amazing. And then obviously it's pitch black, you, you can't really see anything. And then you start using the the the, the scope, the, the the infrared sensor, and all of a sudden you just see all these deer all over the place. And we did get um, barn owl parched, uh, perched on top of a post, um, and also um, feeding on something in the road, and then swiftly flew off. Uh, so yeah, barn owls were seen, um, and uh, that was pretty special. Um, ravens as well, uh, one of the um, reasonably common birds that we got to see. Ravens and hooded crows, probably the most common things, um, and just wonderful to watch um, all their acrobatics. And because it's the end of the, the breeding season, well, pretty much well, beyond the end of the breeding season, we'll see lots of juveniles together with adults. So we saw groups of six or seven uh, quite regularly. Also, dipper was another thing that we're looking for. That was one of the key species uh, from a few members of the group. And uh, certainly up the, the main stem of the river, we did get some really nice views of dipper. Um, and again, just the, just the most charismatic of birds, it has to be said. And stone chat as well. It took us a while, actually. I think it was only day four that we got our stone chat. Um, one of the things about going in the autumn time is there's not a huge number of birds to go and see, but we do spend a lot of time in the field. And uh, if we do see a bird, we spend a good time looking at it. Um, obviously, lots of birds are migrating away to the coast at this time, but of course, some of the stone chats stay behind uh, and don't migrate for the winter and just um, tough it out. And hopefully they will survive the winter. But again, really lovely views of this, this beautiful, beautiful little bird. Um, this was Loch Fleet. Uh, as you may notice, uh, there is actually two rainbows there, um, one just above the scope and one more obvious to the right. Um, it was a trifle inclement that day, um, but, you know, it's, it's Scotland. Sometimes it rains, sometimes it doesn't. Um, at Loch Fleet, we got to see uh, tens of uh, common seals and grey seals. Um, we got uh, lots and lots of oyster catcher, widgeon, and pink footed geese were coming through. And uh, yeah, it was just really, really nice. And obviously, a walk through the Balbley or pine wood as well, which is uh, really quite spectacular and put on a really, really good um, fungal display. Um, in the spring and the early summer trips, uh, we'll have a visit to Loch Fleet. But in addition, there'll also be a visit to the island of Handa, which will be a long day. Um, but it's a fantastic um, island over on the Northwest Highlands on the Northwest coast. Um, amazing for seabirds. It's got over 50,000 pairs of sea, or 50,000 seabirds on it, razorbills, guillemots, um, bonksies, uh, arctic skewers, bonksies, um, great skewers, arctic skewers, um, also common terns as well, and uh, the possibility of sea eagles as well on the way. Um, a really, really spectacular day out, certainly. But obviously, um, at this time of year, uh, there's no point going to Handa because there's not an awful lot there. So we did see some of the spotty harbour seals. Um, we did see one or two of the grey seals as well. Uh, this is a big old male actually from Lairwick Harbour, um, so you won't see him uh, down in Loch Fleet. But if you do go on the, on the Shetland trip, you will probably will get to see him because uh, he's one of the ones that hangs out around about the fishing boats. Um, on one afternoon, uh, we decided we'd go to the Falls of Shin uh, to go and watch uh, the fish jumping. We'd seen um, the fish jumping at the Falls of Glen Calvi, which is just on the edge of the Alladale Reserve. Uh, but we decided to go to the Falls of Shin to go somewhere different. We got lovely red wing, uh, lots of siskin about, nice jay, uh, and also got to see a fish jumping as well. Um, and this actually is the Falls of Shin. Um, this is Glen Begg, so we're coming towards the end of the talk, um, but we did leave the best till last um, because we did find three juvenile ring oozel, which was absolutely fantastic. I was really, really pleased that we managed to find them. Um, so really late in the year, um, you don't you expect them all to have been gone really by um, September time, um, but they were still hanging about uh, in mid-October, which was really fantastic to see. It took us two bites of the cherry to get there, but we got there in the end. And of course, Golden Eagle, that was the, the big one that everybody wanted to see. Now, we had had eagle sightings um, on a couple of previous occasions, uh, but this one uh, was pretty good. So again, this is with the 400mm lens, 
Um, so we're really good views in the binoculars. Absolutely fantastic day. We had three, the two adults, the juvenile flying about. And then we had the, the male and the juvenile together um, and eventually ended up perching. So that's you know, the 400 mil lens. So we just got amazing, amazing views. There's a juvenile with a white tail, with a black band and the white patches on top of the wings. And just what an awesome way uh, to go and end the trip. So thanks very much for listening and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions if you've got them. Thank you very much, Jonathan. That was absolutely fantastic. I love the photographs there. Really lovely to, to look through. Folks, quite a few of you have been sending questions in. That's great. Keep them coming. Uh, we'll keep typing answers to you as you can throughout the evening. Uh, but for now, we'll just go to a short 10 minute break where you can uh, nip the luga and top up your cup of tea or glass of wine. And we'll be back at 8.25. So see you shortly. Okay, welcome back, folks. And Jonathan, back over to you if you'd like to continue. Yep, sure. I'll yep. just start Go my stopwatch, so make sure that I'm on time. <laughs> uh, and uh, now taking us over to Aberdeenshire. Yep. Yeah. There we go. So welcome to sunny Aberdeenshire, uh, believe it or not. So uh, we were in Aberdeenshire, which is to the west and to the north of Aberdeen City. And we visited several locations uh, within that area. We were staying at a place called Ellen, uh, and I will show you our accommodation, uh, which was the Buchan Hotel, uh, the white building on the left hand side. Uh, this was taken from the old bridge, and yes, it is a rainbow, and yes, you were correct in saying it was raining. Uh, but again, we had a rather really, really dry week. Uh, we were really fortunate with the weather, as you'll see with some of the pictures a little bit later on. Uh, the same with, with Allerdale as well. We had um, really pretty good weather there for the time of year. Um, so the accommodation is um, right on the... Um, right in the, the middle of Ellen. It's, um, the bridge goes over the River Ithan, which is spelled with a Y. Um, and so we're very, very close to just, we basically just walk out of the hotel, cross the road, uh, go underneath uh, the new bridge, and then we're at the riverside. And uh, we saw Dipper there quite regularly, and uh, also Grey Heron. We weren't fortunate enough for the otter or the kingfisher, um, but next time, next time. Just to give you an idea of some of the logistics, um, the lower white building on the left hand side, that is where the bar and the um, dining area is. So that's where we had uh, breakfast and our dinner. Uh, the Buckingham Hotel was very comfortable. It's nice and warm. It was clean. It was comfortable. Um, plenty of hot water. That's really kind of what more could you want? Um, even though it is uh, on the road, uh, is Buchan after all is Aberdeenshire actually so it's it's pretty quiet you know after really about nine o'clock and um, so there really wasn't an issue with uh, with the traffic noise obviously this traffic starts to get going at seven o'clock but that's when we went out for our morning walk so um that's fine um Ellen is uh, about 14 miles north of Aberdeen um, it's really well located for all of the visits that we do we're really no more than 45 minutes from the main sites to the north um, of the hotel uh, the two longer trips that we do the trip that goes to um into D side uh, to Glen Tanner and um, that takes about an hour and 15 minutes uh, and again it's about the same journey time to get down to Montrose Basin uh, which is which is well worth the journey so um, there's not really any trips that are you know too long uh, within the vehicle itself and then once we're at those destinations we you know we're out and about and uh, we're having a walk. Uh, so this is the River Ithan. Um, it had been particularly wet um, overnight, and so there was quite a lot of sediment that was in the river. Um, but you can see on the left-hand side um, the riverside walk, and uh, we wandered down past the flats, past the church, past the houses, um, and so we would see. And uh, we got some really nice views of long-tailed tits. Uh, we got some field fare. We got really nice um, song thrush um, and blackbirds feeding on the rowan berries. And of course, we got the dipper um, a bit further up street, stream closer to the bridge. Um, and also there was an old weir a little bit further upstream and we got to see a grey heron there um, pretty much every time that we went there. So uh, that was uh, the regular spot. Um, so it was just a really, really pleasant start to the day. I uh, met at seven o'clock just as it was getting light, um, just went for a walk and then got back to breakfast for eight o'clock. 
Um, so really, really nice uh, start to the day, nice gentle start, just seeing what was out and about, um, seeing if there was anything new. And of course, there's the possibility um, of the otter or the kingfisher. We spoke to people, <laughs> we, we met people quite regularly and they were saying, oh, have you seen the otter yet? Have you seen the kingfisher? But um, they are, so they are there. Um, it just uh, wasn't, we, our timing just obviously wasn't quite right. Um, but just a fantastic place just to start the day. Um, now, this is a common crane. Um, I didn't quite get close enough, uh, clo as close uh, to the one that we saw, but we went up to the Loch of Strath Beg, uh, which is northeast of Ellen. So you go up to the coast, um, you go north of Peterhead, and uh, in that area, uh, there is, it's basically between Peterhead and Fraserburgh, uh, very close to the coast. Um, they've got this amazing. Um, old uh, estuary that was open to the sea. There was a big storm in the 1700s that closed it uh, and it became a freshwater lake. Um, it's the largest um, coastal lagoon, a uh, freshwater lagoon in the northeast of Scotland, uh, probably actually in the whole of Scotland actually, and it is incredibly rich for birds both in the summertime but also uh, in the autumn and the winter. There was an awful lot that was passing through and I did get very, very excited because when we got to the Loch of Strathbeg on the first day, what did we see? We got to see common crane because they've been breeding there um, on and off uh, since about 2012 or 2013. Um, there's been at least five chicks uh, that have been produced and we got to see two of the chicks uh, with presumably the father. Um, so almost full size, um, see them through the binoculars, really obvious. And uh, the first time that I'd ever seen um, Scottish born uh, cranes. And so not part of a reintroduction program, they've just come there of their own volition. They've constantly been seen for the last 30 years passing through, and particularly in the springtime. Um, and just latterly last decade, they've decided to stay and they bred quite successfully. So uh, fingers crossed there's going to be a, a, an increase in the number of crane. So that was a, that, that was really, really exciting. Um, and of course, uh, there was also some North American migrants that had uh, been, well, vagrants that had been blown over. Um, the greater and the lesser yellow legs. Now, unfortunately, they were a wee bit too far away uh, for me to get a photograph off, but we did get views in the binoculars and also in the scope of both of them very, very close together. So in the same field of view, uh, and that was a bit of a mega because uh, the greater yellow legs, I think it's been less than 30 records in the UK. So that was really quite something. Um, and there was also a pectoral sandpiper there as well um, to um, give a bit more North America. So that was really, uh, really, really exciting. Um, and also there's just like loads to see um, so lots of wading birds that are coming through there. We had lots of um, whooper swans that were starting to appear, um, really just uh, just overwhelmed with lots of birds. So the whooper swans, they'd come in from Iceland. Um, there was four of them, two adults, two cygnets that we think had just arrived in a really um, flying against a really strong headwind. And they were absolutely knackered. Basically, the, the, the two cygnets couldn't stand up. They were just, they tried to stand up and they just flopped back down again. And we went back there the next day because uh, we didn't get around the whole reserve because there was so much to see in the first instance, in the first day. And uh, they were still where they were sat. So they were just absolutely knackered um, from really, really flying into very strong headwinds. So once they're committed, they just um, try and get to Strathbeg. So we got to see nearly 100 uh, that were at Strathbeg um, and absolutely beautiful, beautiful birds. And um, we did get to see a marsh harrier as well. Uh, we didn't get to see a male, but we saw female and immature um, flying about. Uh, they, I don't think it's confirmed breeding yet at Strathbeg, but they're seen there very, very regularly and a uh, real delight to go and see them flying about. And we got up. We got one very close flyby actually um, past one of the hides. Um, we also got um, Sparrowhawk there, also Kestrel, Buzzard, as you would expect. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe in a few years' time, we'll start to get the, the white tailed eagles starting to uh, colonize there as well. Um, I was just back from Isla, and there's quite a large number, I think it was about five or six juveniles that were hanging out in Isla, um, all feeding in the geese. And so, you know, Strathbeg's got over, well, over well, up to 40,000 pink-footed geese at peak uh, in September, October time. Um, so um, once the, the news travels amongst the world of the white-tailed eagles, I think they'll be starting to colonise there and uh, having a feast. Uh, well, I have mentioned pink-footed geese. Uh, we'll see a picture of them a bit later on, but there was lots of widgeon as well, lots of widgeon, uh, lots of teal. Uh, the golden eye had started to come in. Um, also plenty of tufted duck as well. Uh, so again, just lovely to see just 
really, really large numbers uh, of these birds coming through, and there's there's going to be tens of thousands of them. Um, but one day you can see ten thousand, the next day you only see a few hundred, um, and it just sort of ebbs and flows, uh, which is part of the the wonder of going to visit those particular sites. And of course, rather brilliant golden eye. So away from Strathbeg, we went to the coast, and really Aberdeenshire's calling card uh, away from D side and the big pine forests uh, is its coast. And as you can see, it was really quite sunny. This is a place called Colliston, which is just near the sands of Forvey uh, National Nature Reserve, which is a very, very extensive area of sand dunes, um, which is uh, quite a place to go and visit. Uh, it's also got a sand, well, a loch there called the Sand Loch, and we we're lucky enough to see a Slavonian grebe uh, that was there, which was quite a surprise, but um, that was pretty good to go and see. Also, um, little grebe there and coot. Uh, that we saw um, at this particular mound just at the top of the hill we watched a uh, kestrel flying in the strong wind uh, really closely we got red-throated diver um, off the coast we got common se harbour seal popping its head up um, and we got some gannets flying by as well uh, so really really lovely place and again it was 20 minutes from Ellen, so it was a very, very short drive that day. Just did a bit of exploring. Uh, we got to see some red admirals um, that we suspect had been blown in uh, by the strong winds that were, that were coming across from the east. And um, we also got some wheat ears coming through uh, as well, so a few uh, late migrants. Oh, and also on the way here, uh, there was a, a tree full of house martens and swallows that, again, um, they were nowhere near bit farm buildings and they were all roosting in a tree and then they were feeding over a cut field. Um, so again, they, 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 they were migrants that were on the way. Uh, we didn't see anything particularly rare, but it's right place, right time. And uh, certainly in the middle of October, there could be um, all sorts of things that turn up um, and pass through just depending on which way the winds are blowing. Um, so it's a really great place. And it's you know even nice just to see you know, kind of common migrants coming through, such as the wheatier or the, the swallows and the house martens. Um, so there's always something to keep your eye out for. Um, in some of the grassland, of course, we uh, we did spot, this was at Strath Strathbeg, actually, we spotted uh, the fox moth caterpillar. So this is a caterpillar that's uh, going to go in over winter uh, as quite a substantial pupa, uh, and then will come out. So it's one of the fairly large sort of ginger coloured um, day flying moths that you get to see. So there was quite a few of these about. Um, this individual was about six centimetres long, uh, so really quite striking. Uh, this is a place called Buckhaven. Um, we were looking over the, the little harbour there. Uh, so we had some really nice views of Turnstone, Juvenile Pied Wagtail, um, plenty Red Shank as well. And uh, yeah, Sanderling had just come in as well. Um, so quite a few waders, lots of gulls to go and have a look at. Um, if you want to go and look at lots of gulls, fishing harbours are the place to go, uh, both at Peterhead and also in Fraserborough. Um, we also had uh, shags that were out in the rock on the left-hand side, to the left of where the, the life ring is, and we just had the most glorious views. Um, in this area and also um, in Peterhead itself, there's an area of exposed rock uh, just on the other side of the harbour wall. Um, we were seeing red through the divers flying past. Uh, we got to see Great Northern Diver. Uh, we also got to see quite a few eider duck um, going past, which was, um, which was really good. And uh, the weather was just absolutely brilliant. And of course, uh, there's a chance for seeing lots of geese. Um, there's lots of barley that's grown round about uh, the northeast, and round about Strathbeg is the main roosting site. Um, and you just get to see tens, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of geese flying from one field to another. Um, we also got to see quite a lot of hoop, uh, pooper swans flying um, to go and feed, and sort of came across them in the fields as well. So, yeah, really fantastic. Uh, so, if you like your geese, um, it's a good place to go. And uh, sometimes there's also uh, snow geese that uh, are in amongst all the big flocks. So you spend quite a lot of time looking through them all just to go and see if you can see a white head popping up. Now, there's keen eyes amongst you will notice that these are not actually geese. Uh, these are lots of ring plover. There was a flock of about 500 ring plover um, that we reckon had, uh, had just arrived and uh, were on the coast and moving through. But we got to see this big cloud of birds um, just wheeling round over the water. And then we were hoping that they were going to come into land. And uh, we're fortunate enough that they did uh, come into land in front of us. And uh, one of the guests um, with great presence of mind took a video of them. And it was just beautiful to hear the, the noise, the wings and see their, um, the shape of the flock as it sort of uh, morphed into all sorts of different shapes, but like a murmuration of starling. 
um, and we just spent about half an hour just <laughs> just watching the uh, the golden plover as they were they were flying around. There was other things to go and see. There was um, red through the divers that were quite close and uh, eider ducks and uh, turnstones as well. But uh, these were the stars of the show, and that was one obviously an awful lot closer up. Um, this was one of the, the other rocky shores that we went to. This is a place called Aberdour. Uh, it's just near the Tour of Troop, uh, which is the one of the, the few, I think there's two mainland uh, gannet colonies in Scotland now. There used to just be one at the Tour of Troop. Um, uh, the beach here, uh, we had some red shank on the beach. We also had some stone chat really quite close in and quite a lot of gulls just bobbing about in the water and a couple of kitty wake uh, in amongst all the common gulls and the black-headed gulls that were on the water. Um, also in the far distance, you might be able to see, looking over to the left-hand side, there's a white-coloured rock. Uh, there's quite a number of cormorants that were uh, roosting there. Obviously, in September time, as uh, of October time, most of the, the seabirds have gone, certainly from the nesting sites, but we were seeing quite a few of them um, on the water. And we certainly picked a few of them up at uh, Montrose Basin that we went to a bit later on. Uh, this is Rattray Head, and this is the, the lighthouse that was built on the, the rocky Skerry. And uh, we've got some really great views of Bartail Godwit and also Great Northern Diver uh, from here. Uh, also in the bushes behind, there's a very large sand dune system. There's bushes behind, um, and that can be particularly good for migrants. The Rattray Head sticks out, um, sort of sticking out just uh, south of Peterhead and north of Aberdeen. And so it's a place where quite often you'll get migrants uh, alighting. Um, but the winds sort of settled down uh, over that the, over the previous few days, so um, we didn't actually manage to go and pick anything up. But um, that's where all the birders go uh, in the northeast if the, the winds are correct, and there's, there's all sorts of stuff that can uh, turn up there. I do remember twitching a dusky warbler there over 20 years ago, and um, it was particularly nondescript, but still a dusky warbler. Uh, but again, another beautiful, beautiful sunny day that we had there. Of course, the red throats uh, that we saw, we got to see one really close at Montrose Basin, um, just in the exit of the South River Esk, uh, where we were having our picnic lunch. Um, and great northern divers uh, were pretty common um, pretty much all the way around the coast. And we got to see them in varying degrees of, of plumage, but, but the bulk of them were going into their, their full winter plumage. Um, it wasn't just uh, looking at birds. This is uh, Baumse, uh, who is a a famous St. Bernard uh, who was resident during the Second World War with the Norwegian Navy who was stationed there. Um, so we find all sorts of things on nature trek trips. Uh, just behind uh, Baumsa, you might be able to see there's a road bridge. Um, you can walk over that. Uh, the body of water to the left is the South River Esk. Um, the Montrose Basin, which is this huge area of um, almost completely surrounded by land, uh, mud flat, uh, is on the far side of the bridge. Um, but the river itself was was really good. We were getting um, harbour seal popping up there. We got um, guillemots. We also got uh, razorbills as well, um, all seen from there, and shags coming up. Um, there's even dolphins that have been seen not quite this far in to the river, but certainly uh, close to the river mouth as well. Um, so kind of productive place to go and look. Um, so there's a bit of walking to do. We just, we're just kind of wandering around the river. Um, and we also went on the other side of the river and up to the left, um, there's a little old fishing village and we stopped there and there was some nice picnic benches, which gave a fantastic elevated view over the river. And we got to see, um, what do we get to see? Um, all the things we mentioned before, red throated divers really quite close. And also from that viewpoint, we got to see common scoter um, on the water, uh, which, was, which was pretty good. So there we go, Guillemots. This was from the road bridge. Um, so this was just slightly bizarre, um, setting up a telescope and everybody looking at you somewhat askance as they were driving over the bridge, but it was a very good viewpoint. Um, we also got to see other things as well. We got uh, a woolly bear caterpillar. This was at our picnic spot um, overlooking the South River Esk. So a woolly bear. And uh, also on the far right-hand side, uh, you can actually see a, um, a frog hopper, an adult frog hopper, uh, which we'll have to add to the species list. Um, Montrose Basin is again another fantastic place and um, there was 30,000 pink-footed geese that were there. We saw about 2,000 of them coming into land but we had to go and leave because we were late for dinner anyway and it was a bit of a drive back. Um, there was also great white egret that was there, there was lots of grey herons that we saw. Uh, there were, oh, what else did we see? Blacktail and bar-tailed godwits uh, in good numbers, um, and also lots and lots of sea ducks, so lots and lots of widgeon, lots of teal. Um, we went to the Scottish Wildlife Trust Visitor Centre there, 
And that gave really fantastic views um, of all of these things. And also there was a coffee machine, which is always welcome. Um, I should say for this particular trip, um, we're pretty well served with, with public toilets. So we're never really too far away from them. So about two hours is our, our maximum. So it's quite a comfortable trip, uh, certainly in that respect. Um, but the Great White Egret was very nice to go and see. Uh, some of the common scoter, uh, you can see um, adults and uh, also some juveniles there as well. Um, so we did get to see about 15 of them bobbing, 15 to 20 that were bobbing in the water. Um, really, really nice to go and see. And we do get to see plenty of roe deer as well. Um, all around about Aberdeenshire, there's a pretty good population of roe deer. So um, we got some really, actually coming back from Rattray Head, we got some really nice close um, views of uh, a mother with a kid, uh, which was really good. I uh, got to see them in the same place, actually, in two separate occasions. Uh, so really beautiful looking deer. And we got to see some jays as well, uh, maybe fairly commonplace where you are, but they've actually just colonised into the northeast really in the last uh, 20 years. And we go to a place called Gicht Woods, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, it's the largest area of native uh, native broadleaf woodland that still exists in the northeast and uh, can be good for sparrowhawk which we did get to see we didn't get to see the goshawk but it's a very regular site for goshawk as well great views of great spotted woodpecker as well and also the castle uh, that used to be owned by uh, lord byron believe it or not the castle also got to pet, got to see Pennon. This is just near Troop Head. Uh, this is made famous by Local Hero. And if you've ever seen that film, uh, you can actually stop by the phone box and get your picture taken there. And we went there to go and see Gannett, uh, to go and see the hundreds of Gannett that were at the colony at the Tour of Troop, which was absolutely fantastic. And it was just really, really great holiday. Lots of different things to go and see, mainly coastal. We went to Glen Tanner Pinewood as well. We got to see lots of fungi and uh, uh, it's, a, it's another fantastic place in the trip. And we finished off the trip, I really wind up now, um, at the Ithan Estuary, where there are thousands of, thousands of eider ducks. So we've got great views um, of eider ducks, and sometimes the king eider does appear as well. So also something to look out for. And that was uh, one of our final mornings on the River Ithan with the sun coming up. Really particularly beautiful. So uh, a really great trip. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Fantastic talk. And Neil, I'll hand over to you now if you're ready to take over. <clears throat> and Neil, I'll just ask you to uh, to unmute. Yeah. And there you go. Yeah, we can hear you now. And um, Lovely. Yeah, that's great. Neil, just um, based on the comments that some people made when you were doing your previous talk, I'm not sure if it was because you were maybe far away from your microphone, sort of moving uh, just with your head naturally as you were talking. So if you could okay. just be mindful of that, just to try and speak uh, clearly and close to your microphone, I could hear you absolutely fine. I think it, it may just depend on um, the connection that's coming through for, for different people. But that's great. Thank you very much. And over to you. Thank you. and. Uh... Um, hello again, everybody. I don't know whether it's going to be all, all the same people listening in or watching in, but um, we're now going to talk about um, the festival weeks and the Nature Trek festival weeks, which are, have been identified uh, back into Scotland for the next year. So I'll be talking about uh, Mull and Speyside. And uh, for those that have actually been um, on these festival weeks in the past, you'll know the natural fact um, up until the last couple of years prior to the pandemic, uh, we actually had a look at uh, doing the French Pyrenees, where we ended up taking over a sort of a whole hotel, uh, ended up being a very, very significant social affair as well as lots of wildlife. And what we're going to try and do now for next year is make that, uh, that home now in Scotland. So in May next year, we're hoping to uh, very much uh, go to Mall for uh, uh, almost like the spring in Mall trip, and then immediately following that um, over to Speyside. So, what I'm going to try and talk about um, now is uh, some ideas about what you might expect should you like to sign up uh, for these two uh, wonderful trips again back into Scotland. So Mull, where's Mull? Well, Mull is off to the west side of, of Scotland. It's the second largest island um, on the Scottish side. And um, it's, the journey there is we, we, gen we generally meet up at uh, Glasgow again. Uh, if you wish, you'll end up being driven by me or someone similar 
Um, we again we go up the, the the side of Loch Lomond and then out on uh, uh, out on the A82. But this time we hang a left, and we go to the lovely town of Oban, the coastal town of Oban, which in itself is a lovely place. And then uh, we take the ferry over to to Mole, probably land at somewhere like Craig Muir. And then for next year, uh, our uh, Mole Extravaganza will be staying in the very stylish uh, Western Isles Hotel at Tobermory which is a lovely hotel that overlooks um, the harbour at Tobermory with its lovely coloured houses and shops. So very special place. I stayed in the hotel last year um, and everybody that was with thought it was a, a wonderful, wonderful place. So really looking forward to that and also to welcome you to Mole um, in lovely surroundings. So let's talk about Mole started off with. Well, um, Mole is the is a place of eagles. Um, when the colleges tried to bring back the, uh, the white-tailed eagle some decades ago, they decided that in actual fact the best place to start would be the Isle of Rum. Um, and they anticipated they'd probably be nesting on cliff faces with lots of food for them with red deer and everything. They released these white-tailed eagles, which then very promptly disappeared from Rum and went to Mole. And so Mole has now become the epicenter for the white-tailed eagles. And since then, of course, there's been considerable success. And they've spread out and they're pretty much uh, over large parts of Western Scotland, some aspects of central Scotland. And as Jonathan has alluded to, it looks like they're beginning to move into East Scotland as well. So um, fantastic news. So uh, the white-tailed eagle is a bird that I always think of as very typical of Mull. And um, it, it cannot be possible to go to Mull for eight days without seeing one of these fabulous beasts. That's not always at such close range, though. Um, and Mull is, is just a really good place for birds of prey. Um, so this is a common buzzard, which I know these days we can see common buzzards pretty much the length and breadth of the, of the country or the, of the nation. Uh, it is our most common bird of prey. But alongside buzzards and alongside white-tailed eagles, we've got golden eagles, which several pairs breed on Mull, and we don't normally have much difficulty in finding them. Uh, there are several pairs of um, Hen harriers, and when we're there in May, we may even sort of witness some of the sky dancing that these marvellous raptors go through. And there's a few pairs of merlins and peregrines as well, as well as the usual kestrels. So it is a bit of a raptor fest. So if you're into your birds of prey, then I rather suspect that uh, Mull is the place for you. Um, of course, um, you can't talk about Mull and not talk about otters. And so it is in some respects, I suppose a lot of people I know have been to Mall will say, it's the land of eagles, it's the land of otters, and that's pretty much it. There's a lot more to it than that. But I have to say, uh, the otters do steal the show, and particularly because the, the road network round Mall pretty much just goes along the sea locks and along the coastlines, and you don't have to work too hard um, at being in the right place at the right time. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I certainly have been guilty, I think, of just driving straight past um, rocks strewn with seaweed and these funny coloured lumps sitting on the rocks, which I might, I might have missed entirely. Um, so they do blend in a little bit. And um, I remember the first time I went to Mole, I spent five days looking for otter and couldn't find one. But so uh, these days they are as numerous as they've ever been. And uh, with lots of pairs of eyes, of course, in these uh, nine seater minibuses and just wandering up and down the roadside and scanning out to sea, I'm quite sure that all of us will see hopefully really nice use of otters uh, next year. So very special animal. Um, and sometimes we get the opportunity of actually seeing some of the more bizarre prey items that they, they take out of the water, including things like octopuses. Um, it's a bit of a battle sometimes, but uh, there's only ever one winner. So the otters and the eagles certainly make an awful lot of, lot of mile. But of course, one of the things we want to do is devote a whole day uh, to go over to the beautiful island of Iona, a very small island down on the bottom end of the mall, um, with a, a very unique heritage. Um, I actually took a photograph of this willow warbler sitting on top of the sign um, very late in the autumn last year. It was a very late willow warbler. I'm not quite sure what it was doing there that late, um, but there you go. And one of the wildlife items we'd like to see on Iona, if we can, is this character, which is not the best of photographs, but I haven't seen too many good photographs of corn crakes. Um, so this is an old photograph I've got from years ago, um, just before it suddenly lurched into an iris bed or into a bed of nettles, as they often do. So we'll be making a lot of effort when we go to Iona to try and see the very elusive and rare corn crake. And this is reputed to be probably one of the best places to try and see the corn crake. So it's a place I've had my best views, I think.
However, it isn't just corncrakes. Uh, the beautiful, uh, beautiful island also has a small population of twite. Uh, my apologies, this, this picture is a winter picture, autumn picture with a twite with the yellow beaks. And when we see them in the spring, they don't have the yellow beaks, but they still have that sort of lovely buffy yellow face area. And for me, I, I just love the little jangles and, and noises they make as they, as they, as they, as they jingle along. Although they're sometimes called the mountain linnet, the reality is they're quite often like sort of lowland grass areas. And they're one of the few birds that's thought to, to never actually introduce any protein to their diet when they're feeding their young. So the young apparently are fed on a, on a mixture of seeds and grasses. So we'll try and see those, but also Iona is particularly important for other reasons as well. And um, the, the famous Iona Abbey um, is there. Uh, there's also a nunnery, uh, some lovely little chapels on the island as well as well as shops. And we get there by simply uh, landing um, on a small foot ferry. So we drive all the way down to Iona, it's quite a drive from Tobermory, all very scenic and loads of wildlife on the way. And then a regular little foot, foot ferry over to, to Iona. We spend the best part of the day on there, probably with, with a backpack on our backs with some pack, with a pack lunch or something similar. And we just walk around the island, just taking it all in. Um, certainly for those people with religious or, or music um, background will find it a very compelling place and it certainly inspired a great deal of uh, people following uh, various religions and, um, and uh, folk music as well. Um, the abbey was, init was initially a, a monastery uh, in the time of St Columba and so the, it is steeped in history associated with, with Christianity. Uh, there's an island community on the on Iona which includes a school and uh, some lovely beaches on there as well. And uh, we, we normally see things like rock doves and um, a lot of the birds on there are actually quite habituated to the many visitors. So you tend to get really good views of things like the rooks that nest on there and house sparrows and starlings and et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes we get lucky with maybe uh, a cetacean or something in the, in, the, in the channel. So that's Iona and that's a whole day and I think it deserves a whole day. And another whole day, associated with our mall trip, uh, we'll be going on something like a catamaran or a boat like this. Um, and this boat uh, will take us, um, similar to the Outer American tour, will take us round to Staffa and also round to, um, to Lunga on the Trashing Giles. And again, um, you know, sort of rerun of what, what also occurs on the Outer American, we'll be looking for things that live on or near to the sea. So we'll be looking and getting great views of things like the Colin or Harbour Seal, uh, this big brother, uh, the grey seal, uh, with this wonderful Roman nose, we'll try and look for some of those, even though they tend to be a little bit more common to the north and east of Scotland rather than on the west. And of course, landing on Lunga and landing on Staffer again, as we did on the Arda Merkin trip, um, we will encounter really close view of seabirds, such as this wonderful shag with that amazing green eye. And you can spend as much time as you like literally just sitting next to these birds, and they're pretty much unperturbed. Um, I don't like it when you get too close to birds, you can see you're unsettling them, but a lot of these birds literally just sit there and almost are as curious of you uh, as you are of them. Uh, Kittaway Colony on Lunga, and also flying birds around the boats as we're actually cruising around the Hebridean Sea. And of course, uh, this is a land of orcs as well. And the little black, the black guillemots, if you can just about see them against the seaweed in flight, the lovely white panels in the upper wing and the underwing and the lovely red, red legs. And the inside of the beak is red as well. Well, a stunning little seabird. But of course, you can't get away from the puffin because the puffin is, is there, as, you, as I've mentioned earlier on today. And you should get good views both in flight. And they may not actually be bringing sand eels in during the time we're there because we're probably just a spot early for pufflings, for pufflings in the burrows. But nevertheless, uh, we'll get great views of puffins because they do uh, attend to the colonies uh, nice and early. And again, coinciding with the, with the spring flowers, which includes bluebells and, and many others as well. Uh, seabirds, other nesting seabirds, razor birds I've mentioned before. And cetaceans, yeah, it's something we always look for, always want to try and find. And if we get really fortunate, we might find at least one species. Uh, this is a harbour porpoise. Uh, we don't very often see them sort of breaching or coming out of the water. I just got a bit lucky one day. So, uh, we'll always be looking for sort of movement in the water from harbour porpoises, dolphins, or indeed anything else. And traditionally, years ago, we used to get, uh, I know we have a question about it um, during the interim, about basking sharks. And sadly, the basking sharks seem to have really tailed off in this, this region now and hardly ever come across them, which is such a shame. Maybe they've just simply moved away to somewhere else, I don't know. But um, 
perhaps some work we could do between uh, now and now. Um, so we devote a whole day to the to the, to the trip on um, the Trash and Shiles and to Staffa. And then, of course, it then allows us several days to wander around Mull at will. And the Great Northern Diver, such as this one, is not a breeding species in the UK normally. Um, but we're quite fortunate on this side of Scotland that quite often there are summer plumage individuals um, spending the summer uh, actually just off the coast. Don't always see them quite as good nick as this, but it just, there's nothing more exciting, I don't think, than seeing a small squadron of great northern divers um, coming into the, into the shallows to feed on crabs and fish. Uh, fantastic looking birds. But we do have enough chance of seeing um, black throated divers, maybe, but very infrequent and more often red-throated divers that, that, that do breed with us. Uh, being on a nice big island such as Mole, of course it has its own population of mammals. Um, and as you've seen quite a few red deer pictures already this evening, and here's yet another one. Um, and in May, of course, the red deer may not be looking at their best because um, they will actually be just losing their winter coats. So they'll be looking a bit patchy and some of the stags will have lost their antlers as well with a view to sort of growing some more during the summer and early autumn. Um, but there's quite a few mammals which are actually absent from, from mole. So um, pretty much we, we, we won't see foxes, we won't see badgers. And allegedly there are not uh, wildcats there and there are not pine martins. But in the last decade, there's been reports of both. So who knows what, what actually might be living on, on the Isle of Mole. So the mole really in itself is, uh, I haven't really done it justice. It's just a little, little spin round, um, about a wonderful island, loads of things to see. Um, but because our time is limited, I need to move on to the second part of, of the festival week. And as for the second, second period, we're going to be actually in, centered in Speyside. And this picture of green that you may be able to see in front of you actually just, just depicts the Cairngorm National Park, uh, which does enco encompass many of the places in actual fact that we'll be visiting. Um, and for this tour, again, uh, we'll be meeting with people generally at Inverness um, and also at Aviemore. Uh, and bringing you all together to stay at the, the lovely uh, Nettybridge Hotel, a fabulous building, uh, lots of heritage, uh, a long history of, um, of having naturalists and wildlife people there, um, and a great place to stay for, for our period, um, actually um, looking around Speyside and far beyond. Um, so this is all about um, some of the birds that are perhaps more, the more iconic birds associated with the uplands as well as some of the animals and insects as well. And if we can get you up there, <laughs> uh, what we hope to do is, is get you onto some of the more montane species. And Jonathan's always shown some great pictures of ptarmigan. Uh, this is another ptarmigan here. If we can get you onto, onto one of the Cairngorm mountains one way or another, this is a bird we'd lovely, love to show you simply because they tend to be quite tame, quite approachable. And uh, there's something very special about a ptarmigan that can get through uh, a mountain wilderness during the winter. We'd be love to find some, some dotterel for you. Uh, very, another very special bird of the uplands. It's no wonder they're rare when the female lays the eggs and then lets the male do all the, um, do all the, uh, the rest of the work. No wonder they're rare. If it, down to the female, probably would be a much more common. But there you go, the dotterel, this is a male dotterel and it's got a, a chick in front of it. And what you probably can't see is it's actually got another chick underneath it, which it's trying to, trying to brood. Um, so it'd be great to get you up onto some of the mountain slopes, like Carnbound Moor or Cairngorm. Uh, to try and get you to see some of these upland birds. Another bird you don't have to go quite so high for, but we should see in reasonable numbers is the beautiful golden plover. Again, uh, Jonathan's fantastic shots earlier on of that flock is just, just amazing. Sewing machine action as they fly over you, wonderful birds. Uh, perhaps even more gorgeous in the summer, in summer plumage when some of these birds have um, very black bellies. Uh, this bird was actually photographed with a rainbow behind it, and it was all raining on and off. And of course, on Heather Moors and other upland areas, uh, we're looking to try and find red grouse. So the beauty of the, the space eye trip is that we have an opportunity of getting all the grouse, pretty much. Um, black grouse um, is, a, is a fairly difficult species to pin down because the lek sites tend to vary from year to year. So we need to get some good local knowledge to find out where the lek site is. But I'm sorry, folks, but it will be an early morning start if we want to hear all the, the bells and whistles of a uh, of a black grouse lek as they, as they let rip on a, on a cool, cool um, space side morning. Um, Capricalia are altogether a different, different thing now, and it might not be possible to go looking for those simply because they're so scarce. And in general, it's, it's 
we are asked to stay out of the forest where they may be. But who knows? Who knows what might happen? Uh, another bird of this area, and I know again I share Jonathan's um, passion for some of the thrushes, and particularly the ring ouzel. Um, love them to bits. And it's always a very special day when you see the ring ouzel with our wonderful calls and markings. And we'll make every effort to try and find some ring ouzels, probably towards the base of the Cambrians. And of course, there are some generalist birds up here. So if you're like me, a Midlander, uh, if, you, if you live on the east coast of, of England or southern England, you're probably not used to seeing hooded crows very much. Okay, if you live in Ireland or, um, or western and northern Scotland, you're used to seeing hooded crows. But for me, they're, they're, they're quite a nice thing to see. And so we'll certainly see plenty of hooded crows in, in actually both regions we're, we're visiting uh, during the festival fortnight. And of course, ravens have all of a sudden done what um, buzzers have done, done what, uh, done what polecats have done, and that is spread back over their original old haunts. But it's still great to see a raven in a wild place up in Scotland. And uh, we'll see these and hear these pretty much everywhere we go in all the different habitat types. We can talk about um, some of the specific habitats um, in Speyside. Um, but in actual fact, some of, the, some of the really nice areas are actually on the sort of lowland area. Uh, this is uh, uh, Rutherford Barracks. Um, this is sort of far from places like Inch, uh, not too far from Abbeymore, King Cray, King Lusty, those sort of places, not far off the A9. Uh, and very close to here is the Inch Marshes, uh, which is uh, an extensive area of marsh and reeds, uh, most of which is managed by the RSPB. And this hopefully will be a venue that we'd like to visit during the course of, of the Speyside Week. Uh, there's an opportunity of seeing birds um, such as waders, ducks, birds of prey uh, moving around uh, in the sort of habitat. And of course, um, the roe deer. Uh, hopefully, we won't have to go looking for the roe deer. Um, hopefully, the roe, the roe deer will find us because this is the sort of area that you'll tend to see them often early in the morning, sometimes at dusk, but sometimes during the daytime as well. And um, I like all the deer, but I just think there's something very special about the roe deer. Very, very lovely looking animal. And if we're at Inch Marshes, uh, we're in Osprey Territory. And although now um, uh, down in Rutland, um, in the middle, middle of England and down on the south coast, we're seeing reintroduction programmes for, for Ospreys. Uh, the reality is, is that really the epicentre for Ospreys is very much in Speyside. They've now spread into southern Scotland. Uh, they're going west as well. And um, we're seeing sort of the North Wales, Wales population picking up as well, which is all great news. But we will still make the effort to go and see the iconic Osprey at Speyside. And uh, Lock Inch is probably one of the better places we'll go to look for them. And if we're lucky, we might see Goldeneye there as well. This is a female with ducklings. Probably this is more sort of a June picture rather than a May picture, but we may see the male and female Goldeneyes on the lock nonetheless. And another speciality for the Speyside area, of course, is the beautiful um, summer plumage, Slavonian Green. And there's only a very small population of Slavonian groups that, that nest in Scotland, far more in places like Iceland and further west over on to Canada. But um, there are two, two locks that we like to visit, um, and we'll endeavour to try and visit at least one of these during the course of, of, the, of the tour. They've not fared so well in recent years, but um, one of the locks in particular still has a good population of Slavonian groups, and sometimes we can get nice and close to them. More likely, and in the same habitat, we'll probably see the different grebes. Uh, wonderful little things that tend to nest on, little, on the smallest of waters, uh, bring up those wonderful little, little humbug striped youngsters. And up in Scotland, of course, as soon as you go north of the border, and indeed from northern England upwards, the siskin becomes an extremely common bird. Um, the wonderful males with this vivid yellow and gorgeous black crowns is, is a stunning little yellow finch. And even if you don't see them a great deal, you hear them all the time as a, as a jangle over and piercing calls from tops of trees. And we'll see those almost in every habitat that we visit during the course of Speyside. And not to be outdone, but a similar sort of size is the beautiful lesser red pole, which again is a common bird north of the border. Um, down here in Middle England, we tend to get them um, on passage and in the winter. But in, in Scotland, and particularly in Speyside, uh, the lesser red pole is a fairly common bird. And quite often you'll hear them looping away over the trees. And if you're lucky, you might even get a nice one with a sort of a, a pinkish dress that you can just about see on this bird. Another habitat I'd really like to get people into is the wonderful streams and rivers. Um, I think Jonathan's a, a fan of that kind of habitat as well from the sound of where he's talking. 
And of course, we can get into these wonderful birds of, uh, of fast flowing streams, such as grey wagtails. Terrible name for a gorgeous bird, but I suppose the name yellow wagtail was already, already taken up by another bird. And the black throat tends to suggest this bird may well be a, a breeding male. Uh, other birds in similar sort of habitats of fast flowing streams, rivers, sometimes on the lock side is the common sandpiper. Uh, quite a furtive bird, wonderful bobbing motion, um, bowed wings as it flies away, and a real sharp piping call. Yet again, another bird that we probably find us if we find it. And of course, uh, the dipper. Uh, we cannot go, not go looking for dippers. Um, still very rare down this, my part of the world, but up in Scotland, uh, they're holding their own, absolutely fine. And of course, in Britain, we have uh, our own population, our own type of dipper with the sort of rufous, uh, rufous chestnut uh, belly. So we'll be looking for dippers and we're looking for various different rivers, probably not very far from where we're staying in Nebbybridge, um, if we're looking for dippers. Um, other habitat I haven't mentioned yet, but really the forests and woodlands of Speyside are very special indeed. We've got a Caledonian pine forest, but we've also got extensive birch, a little bit of beech and oak as well. And of course, all this habitat is a wonderful habitat for the red squirrel. And for those people who are familiar with traveling on the west side of Scotland, you'll probably struggle sometimes to find a red squirrel on that side. But in central Scotland and eastern Scotland, in particular where the rainfall is less, uh, the red squirrel is still quite plentiful. And I really don't think we can't possibly go through the whole thing without anybody seeing the red squirrel. And of course, in the Caledonian pine forest, we have this strange bird called the crested tit. Uh, something about, I don't know, probably about a thousand pairs, very sedentary. I don't think there's ever been a record in England ever. They don't seem to move anywhere. They are an isolated population because we have crested tits all over the continent in a variety of different habitats. But these crested tits in the Caledonian pine forest just stay put and do what they do. They don't seem to sort of be increasing. They don't seem to be going down. They're just doing their own thing. And we will definitely go and look for these birds, uh, which are very special. And uh, we're, we're quite lucky this. They will probably come from fur feeders even in there. Are the birds of woodland? Well, generalists would be the common tree creeper. You can find us almost anywhere in the UK. But nevertheless, it's great to see. It's amazing how often um, you hear these birds and don't see them. You realize how common they are. That wonderful, uh, curious way of working away up a tree like a small mouse. And um, we'll almost certainly hear this before we see it. And this is the wonderful wood warbler. Uh, it's pure white underside and the yellow breast. It's a fantastic trilling song and a crescendo of noise when the whole bird shakes with the whole effort. And so we, again, we'll probably hear these almost within, within range of, uh, of our hotel, but if not, we'll go just a short distance to go looking for wood warblers and also common red stars that tend to nest in the same habitat. And being there in May, of course, we're seeing the forest wake up with both resident birds and animals and the spring migrants arriving as well. If you're into sort of, uh, again, iconic birds of Caledonian pine forests, then you can scratch your heads on the, on the crossbill complex. Um, it seems that there are common crossbills, there are Scottish crossbills, and there are parrot crossbills. And I do believe my photograph here is of a parrot crossbill. Um, it's, it's debatable as to how many different species there really are, uh, but we will try ev everything we can to find these nomadic groups of birds, and if we can, to try and get some kind of view of them. Um, so yeah, there's, there's technically um, the, the Scottish crossbill to find, which is, um, they also possibly the red grouse, so the uh, uh, birds almost endemic to the, to the British Isles. Um, Possibly an emblem of a really good habitat, lack of pesticides. Uh, if you've got green tiger beetles running around your, your, your pad, then you're, you're probably doing something right um, with the habitat. Uh, these things are predatory ground beetles that run around very fast and um, across, across tracks and uh, a rather gorgeous looking insect really, and we'll try to find some of these as well. And it's not just insects. Um, Scotland still has wonderful blooms of orchids. If you're really good at orchids, we'll be testing your abilities to test the hybrids from the pure forms of um, spotted heath, common spotted, various different marsh orchids. And of course, with them is the wealth of bees that somehow cope with the wind and wetness of Scotland. And the carder bees tend to dominate the group. But in actual fact, uh, the more we're finding out about bees, um, the more complex it seems. Um, we won't see an awful lot of insects, probably. Um, during our time in May. It's a little bit early, and it's probably a little bit early for this beast as well, but we'd like to see something like a northern emerald dragonfly. And um, the dragonflies up there do tend to be uh, rather special. 
Uh, but it might just be a touch early for those, but certainly we'll, we'll be looking out for them. Um, the last sort of bit of the, the tour really will be uh, almost sort of emphasizing what Jonathan said about the wonders of the East Coast. And uh, we'll be wandering over to the, the, the Moray Firth area, uh, looking for seabirds, looking for sea ducks. And wherever we go uh, on, our, on our visitations uh, around this wonderful part of uh, the, the nation, we'll always keep an eye out for the peregrine. I'm conscious of the time, so um, I'm going to leave the, the talk there. But what I'd really like to say is that um, we're setting these tours up really to be a, a social event, very much to, to really um, celebrate wildlife, celebrate the habitat, look at the wonders of Scotland, both in Mull and Speyside. And I, for one, and I know uh, with members of the Nature Trek team is there as well, would all like to enjoy it with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. That was fantastic. Particularly interesting. Um, I'll be leading the uh, the Wildlife Festival on Mall, or one of the leaders, I should say. So um, really nice to see all of that detail illustrated there. Right, folks, we're happy to take some questions now. If I could just ask uh, Jonathan to turn on his camera. I Maybe I stopped it. So there we go, giving permission to, uh, to restart the camera. Thank you, Jonathan. And we've got Alison here as well. So uh, we'll take some questions now. So we did have one from uh, Claire Stairs asking about um, doing night drives in search of, of wildlife, um, particularly in search of wildcat during the Nature Trek tours. So we do do night drives um, in search of general nocturnal wildlife. So looking for pine marten, owls and things, of course, not specifically looking for, for wildcat. It'd be quite difficult to, to see, um, although it wouldn't bother them uh, if we were doing night drives looking for them. Uh, Neil, did you, I'm not sure if you were, it says that you were trying to answer this question live. So I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything to that. Uh, the only downside is the fact that on the, the Ard de Merkin used to be like the stronghold for the Scottish wildcat. But with the demise of the rabbits on, uh, on that, that particular peninsula, apparently there isn't a single rabbit left now. The wildcat population has absolutely fallen away. So now we're not even sure how many pure wildcats, if any, are still left in that terrain. Uh, we know there are some hybrid animals, but um, still after five years, I'm still not convinced I've seen a pure wildcat yet. Thanks, Neil. Caroline Woodley is asking, what's the best time of year to visit Scotland for butterflies, dragonflies and other insects? When it's sunny. <laughs> <laughs> the peak, the peak, well, it depends what you want to go and see. You know, it's, it's really from late May, late May onwards. If you want to see your peak number of dragonflies, it's going to be late June, July time, depending on when the spring started. Um, but it, it it's so it just depends so much on what the what the previous two three weeks weather's been like. If you've got a really good settled spell, then you'll get to see lots. But but generally between June, July, and August, that's going to be your your peak period. Thanks, Jonathan. And uh, a question from Paul Tucker. Hi, Paul. Nice to see you here. Um, asking, are white-tailed eagles in Speyside yet? They are. Uh, there aren't many yet. Um, probably our best opportunity of seeing them, sort of my experience, has been probably the Finthorn Valley, which I didn't really mention. Uh, it's the Valley of the Eagles, or one of its names, and we, we always look for golden eagle there. But um, quite often now we do encounter white-tailed eagles. So, yeah, there's every chance we could get a white-tailed eagle. But um, really, if you want to see a white-tailed eagle, uh, the West is best. Thanks, Neil. And Claire Eady was asking earlier about whether we could see basking sharks on our trips. Um, the best place to see basking sharks in Scotland um, is off the Isle of Col, uh, one of the best places, um, really. And it's the best, one of the best places in the UK, along with Cornwall. Um, we have a tour to call, which offers a good possibility to, to see them from there. So really going end of June, July, uh, which is when the, the trip runs. The trip runs from May through to July uh, would be a good option. Uh, also, actually, the St Kilda cruise, which I lead, if you wanted to go on a 10-day cruise, which departs from Oban, uh, we've had fantastic encounters with basking sharks 
uh, from that vessel when we've sailed close to coal, but we can't guarantee that the itinerary um, would always go via coal. Um, so they're more an incidental sighting. But we have had superb experiences with them. Um, two individuals actually swing, uh, swimming alongside the boats. They, when they're feeding, they tend to go into this um, almost hypnotic state and we switch the engines off just to let them do their thing. Uh, and they didn't even realize until the very last minute that there was a huge boat right in front of them and they were just about to glide straight into it, totally in a trance, uh, feeding on all of their, their plankton. So brilliant sightings. And I've been on call myself just on my own trips in, in late August um, and July and you know, seen sort of 10, 15 basking sharks just from my, my bedroom window. Neil, did you want to add anything to that? I'm not sure if you were typing a response to it. Only in as much the negative news is that despite um, getting close to coal when we go out on some of the boat trips, we never, we've never done any good. Um, in fact, some of the places that the boatmen used to take us to, we used to see lots of basking sharks, they're no longer there. So I think that, again, um, I think coal is probably still the best place. Mm. But um, when we have managed to get near to coal, we've just not found them. So um, probably the American trip is not one of the better ones to try and find a basking shark. Mm, it does depend quite a bit on the temperature of the water at the time. You know, if it just happens to be colder that week and um, they just go a bit uh, a bit further away where the, the plankton is, they just like all of the plankton comes to the surface when it's nice and bright and sunny. And that's what the sharks are coming up to, to feed on. They're cold blooded. They're not mammals like whales and dolphins. So they like to come up to the surface to, to warm up there as well. And of course, they can be trickier to spot because they don't need to come up to breathe. So it's not like looking for a whale or dolphin that needs to come up every couple of minutes to 20 minutes and um, so it can be a bit trickier but it depends on how the uh, the plankton is doing on, on that particular week. Um, we have a question from John Packer asking about uh, walking ability um, and what is required for the Allerdale trip. Um, well there's uh, we had a gentleman um, the last trip who who couldn't we couldn't walk, you know, sort of five, 10 minutes was his kind of max and we, we could accommodate that. But usually the, the walks that we're doing are on the vehicle tracks uh, and they're maybe up to, you know, we'll be out for, you know, I think exceptionally we're out for actually for two hours and one walk, but we didn't cover an awful lot more than a mile because we're looking at lots of stuff. Um, so that, that would be sort of the maximum length of walk. Uh, because we do drive there and back along the same track sometimes to go to a destination. We did drop people off um, and arrange to go and meet up with them if they wanted to go for a longer walk. So there is a bit of flexibility um, if you're happy to walk on a track on your own or with another person, if you wanted to do more walking, but then you're not necessarily with the group. But but we can we can usually accommodate um, you know various different abilities of walking. But certainly to go and look for the ptarmigan, that's a bit more strenuous. So um, if you want to go and look for them, you need to be you know pretty fit. Thanks, Jonathan. And a question that uh, we've had a couple of people mention this this evening, it's a quite common one asking about how easy is it to be vegetarian, uh, vegetarian options when traveling in Scotland? Um, I'll put that either to Jonathan or Neil, whoever wants to answer it first. It's, it's better than it was. Um, and to be honest, every, everywhere that we stay, it's it's not a problem. There's there's usually more than one vegetarian option. Certainly at the Buchan Hotel we were staying at, we had a few people who were vegetarian. They got something, you know, there was there was options for them. It was different. And um, so that was and they, they said the food was uh, was was very nice. Um, and at Allerdale, because we've got a personal chef, well, um, you get some really nice stuff. <laughs> there were some jealous looks at some of the vegetarian dishes, like, oh, <laughs> so um, yeah, so so there's no problem, no problem accommodating that with, with the accommodation we go to. And certainly on, uh, on the Isle of Merkin, um this year, <laughs> I had some fellow guests who were looking over at the vegan and vegetarian dishes and asking for that one for the next night. So um, yeah, I think all around it's, it's been absolutely fine. That's great. Thanks, both. And I can say from my own personal experience, um, uh, being vegetarian when I was on Mull earlier this year, absolutely no problem at all. Uh, so I'll just see what other questions we have, if we've had any come in. I think we've answered quite a lot of them. If anyone else has a, an urgent burning question, please do type it to us. Um, oh, I've had one from Monica Taylor asking um, about plants on our tours. 
um, and ferns and lichens specifically. So I'm not sure if you'd be able to uh, to answer this, Neil or Jonathan. This may not be your forte, um, but uh, asking if we see uh, many ferns and lichens and the best place to go for them on our trips. Well, all I can say is that I, my knowledge is, is absolutely awful, but um, certainly as I alluded to with the um, uh, with the Celtic rainforest. Um, it's just full of lichen, mosses and, and the like. And you could, I think you could spend your whole holiday just examining and uh, lo looking and enthusing over that. It's the greens and the greys just draped all over the oak trees. Um, there's no getting away from it, but I'm afraid when it drills down to actually specific species and, and knowledge, I'm afraid I just don't have it, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Again, um, as long as I've got my fern book with me and uh, you know some one of my lichen books I'm, I'm happy but there's there's just there's a lot um you know so, certainly not with the ferns there's not like a massive number but certainly with the lichens there's a lot um but there's some really really interesting reasonably easy to identify ones that we will see in quite quite regularly and the fungi as well were fantastic at Aladale, so um so yeah yeah there's plenty to look at great thanks Jonathan Alison, just moving on to something a bit tastier, is there a chance to sample whiskey on the Isla trip? Oh, no, no, no. I think that's uh, to total abstinence. Um, no whiskey at all. <laughs> none of the hotel, none of the distilleries, no. That's not something I was we also say really Speyside might be the one we're talking about tonight as well. So so both on a, on the Isla trips as well as the Speyside trips, there are local whiskey distilleries and mostly the hotels we stay at generally tend to stock um, at least some samples of those. So anyone who wishes to um, can certainly partake. Um, we don't tend to uh, fit distillery visits in as such into the trips just because there's so much to see um, as it is already. Um, however, if anyone particularly wanted to, uh, we could probably arrange a visit um, um, instead of one of the morning or afternoon trips, depending on when the tours were going on. Yeah, similarly, when um, I'm doing my St Kilda cruise, we stop in Loch Sunart and we stop at Glen Borrowdale and we go to the little uh, natural history centre there, usually for a cup of tea. And we walk past the distillery, which is there. And I always offer people to go on in if you want to. We've got a couple of hours here. Um, and people are always very good. They're very reserved and restrained. I always want to go straight to the natural history centre. And clearly cake is a bit more tempting for them. Um, I don't know. We're only on day two of the trip at this point. So maybe <laughs> <laughs> maybe at that point, cake still seems the more, more appealing uh, uh, thing. But um, yeah, there are, are options for, for sampling uh, local, local alcohol and local fare, I would certainly say. Um, just going back to the plant question slightly, um, the, we do run one trip to Scotland that is specifically for plants. Uh, we do a Ben Loris trip, um, so um, a kind of wild plants of Ben Loris and Perthshire trip that we do in the summer, um, and that is specifically looking for uh, plants, um, particularly the high alpine plants, um, but also um, a variety of other habitats as well. So if you're particularly interested in Scottish plants, then that's a good one to, to head out on. Thanks, Alison. And Neil, I've got a question for you um, from Sheena Grattan asking what the accommodation is like in the bunkhouse. Is it similar to a three star hotel? Yeah, I, all the rooms are en suite, first of all. Uh, they're, they're all sort of preheated as well. You can control the temperature. They vary. Um, each, each, some rooms are just single rooms, some are, tw some are doubles, twins, some have got three or four beds in. Uh, so they do vary in their size and the idea was that um, it was once an outdoor outdoor uh, pursuit centre and then converted into a bunkhouse um, but each one is, is your own room so there's lots of lots of privacy and, um, and then we the idea is that there's a there's a kitchen there for for use um, for anybody who wants to make a, a cup of tea or a cup of coffee at any stage during the night if you're suffering from insomnia we want to go and see the prime minister at two o'clock in the morning there's an outside light that's left on permanently to see the wildlife is actually moving around as it always is at 2.30 in the morning. Uh, it's a very, very comfortable arrangement, a lovely sort of uh, sitting room area. Um, quite often when I'm doing the logs, people are falling asleep in front of me. It's not through um, too much whiskey, it literally is the Scottish air and the Scottish food and the comfort that uh, we all enjoy. So I very rarely have people sort of get concerned about the facilities at the bunkhouse. Bunkhouse is the wrong term. It just almost sort of some always thinking you're actually in like a camping kind of establishment. It's far from that. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I haven't stayed there overnight, but I have visited it um, when I was passing through. 
And uh, yeah, no, it's very comfortable and very cozy looking. <laughs> Uh, thank you all for your lovely comments, folks. Having some really nice comments coming in, saying that you've all enjoyed uh, the talks this evening. And I think we've gone through all of the questions. So that just leaves me to say a huge thank you to Neil and Jonathan for speaking to us tonight and for Alison for joining us too. And thank you all so much for joining us from home. It's been really lovely to see the wonders of some real gems here on our very doorstep. And our roadshow continues next week, where we'll need to metaphorically wrap up as we'll be talking about our polar cruises, taking you to Spitsbergen, Arctic Norway, Antarctica, and the Falklands. So that's next Tuesday, the 23rd of November. Also next week at 3 p.m. on Wednesday, the 24th, we've got our next virtual tour, which will be broadcast live from the Bren in central France, where you can join our guides, Jason and Tony, as they position themselves to view hundreds of migrating common cranes. We hope, keep your fingers crossed. As always, this is a live virtual tour, so we never know what's going to happen, but uh, hopefully uh, the common cranes will have got our voicemail and will turn up as we hope. And we hope that you can join us too. So you can sign up on the homepage on our website and you'll also receive a follow-up email tomorrow from this webinar, which will contain the link for you to register. So we hope to see you there. If you think of any more questions after this evening, please don't hesitate to give us a ring in the office or drop us an email and we'll be more than happy to chat to you. So until the next time, it's goodbye from me and take care everyone and we'll hope to see you next week. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye folks. <laughs>